slowly, day by day, a mandala finally appears in this Tibetan temple. Monks here are participating in this special kind of practice in which the goal is the creation of a mandala. The mandala represents the world in which we live, and in this world all things are in harmony, and all men are equal. The intention in the creation of a mandala is to depict an ideal world. Today, humankind is increasingly searching for a way of life that is closer to nature. For millions of years, man has engaged in a struggle with nature, in the process of gaining wisdom and finding ways to survive in the planet's very diverse environments. Western Sichuan is situated at the edge of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. The people of Tibet follow a traditional belief system which teaches that all things have their own gods and that their homes are the region's snow-capped mountains and mountain lakes. The area surrounding this Tibetan Buddhist temple is a paradise for wild animals. The white-eared pheasant is found only in the Hungduan Mountains. At the moment, it's the brooding season. The pheasants have commandeered the temple as part of their territory. But there are also some creatures running wild in the temple. They are Himalayan marmots, and it has to be admitted that they do seem a little fat. Their Tibetan neighbors treat these chubby little animals rather like pets, and they not only share food with them, sometimes they talk with them as if they are friends. It's 
Zorpu Lake, situated high in the mountains, is a product of glacial activities in the very distant past. Its clear water is like a gem magically transplanted into this mountain forest. It is, in fact, the most sacred lake in western Sichuan. Every morning after prayers that are to him an everyday routine, a young monk walks through the nearby forest. He is on his way to meet up with some old friends at Tsuopu Lake. The sound of a conch shell echoes across the valley and the tranquil surface of the lake subtly changes. It seems a school of fish have heard the call and in response are quickly gathering around. At this time, every day, he tosses into the lake the food he has brought from the temple. He likes to share all he has with the fish. The fish respond in a way that seems to bring life to the entire valley. For the young boy, this is a sacred moment full of ritual significance. Hengduan Mountains in this region were formed when the Indian subcontinent collided with the Eurasian Plate. Today, the ravines here are home to gibbons, Tibetan macaques, Asian elephants, and many other rare animals. As extraordinary as it may seem, rice has been cultivated in China for nearly 8,000 years. Rice planting on these high mountains was a major innovation of the ancestors of the Hani people. What we see here are terraced fields that have been developed by man for thousands of years. The exploits of these people here have turned these dry mountains into layers of wetland. In a honey village, Chen Kunyu is carefully cleaning some eggs. The lives of the honey people revolve entirely round rice cultivation. These eggs are set aside for the most significant festival of their year, the Planting Out Festival. Now though, most young honey people have migrated to the cities to find work, and it's difficult for them to return every year to celebrate this festival. It seems the tradition of rice planting in terraced fields in April is becoming less important to the honey people. However, some still practice this ritual handed down to them for countless generations.
The eggs are dyed red, symbolizing a blissful festival and the future harvests. Chun places two red eggs into a carefully woven bag and then hangs it around her son's neck. She does this to ensure her son will forever remember this festival, which is the most important festival of the honey people. Swallows have returned, announcing that the season for planting is drawing ever closer. The seedlings are now ready. Women wear special clothes as they transplant the rice seedlings. It's long been a tradition here for people to gather together to help each other at this time. Transplanting rice seedlings involves spending long hours working in the fields. Among the honey people, it's mainly done by women. After it, the honey people put on their most festive costumes and begin an elaborate celebration. In the river valley of the Hengduan Mountains, the honey people have established villages, terraced fields and rivers, a result of their long cultivated wisdom. These layers of three-dimensional space are really a form of natural art that has no equal. Cooked in the pot, aired, and then gently rubbed. In Lhasa, Ren Qing, an incense maker, is producing Tibetan incense following traditional methods. In Tibet, it is this kind of incense stick that people most commonly use. Its production involves the use of saffron, snow lotus, musk, borneol, and many other precious Tibetan medicines and herbs. Everything is made by hand. The spices are mixed in various proportions and undergo numerous processes. The result is Tibetan incense, a condensation of the essence of nature. The incense maker has to be hands-on, taking care of every process entirely on his own. Every incense maker has his own secret formula. 
in the hands of Renqing, time and time again a variety of raw materials undergo various transformations. At the moment, he's working on the final part of the process, and in doing so, he seems quite calm and serene. A first-class Tibetan incense maker depends entirely on the feel of the incense in his hands. From apprentice to master, it has taken wrenching ten years to fully get the hang of it. season of new life and fresh growth. In Sichuan's Xiaoliang mountains, priests of the Yi people are doing what they have always done every spring. They are praying that everything in the surrounding mountains will thrive and prosper. Junjung, a young man of the Yi ethnic group, is sharpening his sickle. Right now, spring is the best time to go into the mountains to collect various kinds of precious herbs. Along with his three companions, Jun Zhang will spend half a month in these mountains. Although all of them grew up in this area, they know they will still face many challenges. In the mountain forest, Tibetan macaques enjoy what is for them the best time of the year. In the wet spring, all plants are sprouting, and it seems that everything is their favourite, and they still have time to play. The only thing interrupting their activities is the unrelenting spring rain. Tibetan macaques are only found in China. They tend to live together in troops of several dozen individuals, sometimes even hundreds. They are also the largest macaques found in China. Due to the imminent rainfall, the temperature in the mountain forest suddenly drops. Now, only the newborns have the energy to play.
The leader of the troop is usually the largest, the macaque alpha male. He is far more familiar with the area than any other members of the troop. He climbs up the cliff and with a unique cry summons his followers to get together. As it happens, on the cliff there's a large natural cave which offers shelter from the rain. At the behest of their leader, the macaque troop gathers. After the rain, there's a sudden increase in the volume of water in the mountain stream. It causes the ladybug to be brought into a world with which it is unfamiliar. The stream races down from the mountains and gushes onto the rocks. Later, it will flow into the Dadu River and then pour into the Min River and eventually it will become part of the mighty Yangtze River. After flowing out of Sichuan, the Yangtze River doubles in volume. With its abundance of rainfall, this mountainous region in China's southwest is a vital source of water for the Yangtze River Basin. The path of Junjiang and his companions is blocked by a swollen stream, but in their quest to cross the river, they find a natural bridge. These high altitude areas in the Xiaoyang Mountains are far removed from the world of man. Few outsiders ever come here. Only people who have lived here for generations can be familiar with the region's streams, peaks, and primeval forests. Their long journey has finally paid off. They find Gastrodia elata, a medicinal herb that is very hard to collect. After toiling in the mountains for half a month, Jun Zhang returns home with a rich harvest. The Yi people live among high mountains and their lives are closely interrelated with what they acquire from the mountains. The Tongbai Mountains form a barrier between the Yangtze River Basin and the Huai River Basin. Moisture originating in the south drifts across the Tongbai Mountains, forming a spectacular scene. When the clouds rise, rain will quickly follow. The primary rainy season in the southern region of the Yangtze River typically lasts 50 days. This season's rainfall will account for three quarters of the area's annual rainfall. The Huai River Basin is surrounded on three sides by mountains and it runs across five provinces. It has more than 40 major tributaries. Because of its flat lower reaches, the Huai River is China's most flood-prone river. On average, the river floods the area once every three years.
In the Meng Hua area, in the middle reaches of the Huai River, hard-working people are carefully working on every piece of land that can possibly be cultivated. However, their hard work will not necessarily result in a good harvest. When the water level of the Huai River exceeds the warning line, the entire area will be flooded. That being the case, compared to planting crops, a better option might well be raising waterfowl. The people living close to the Huai River are very aware of this reality. To prevent the land from being inundated by floodwaters, all the villages here are built on dams or artificial platforms. Over the years, five large-scale water control projects, more than 30 reservoirs, over 20 flood water storage and discharge areas, and various dike projects covering thousands of kilometers have been built. The Huai River has become a managed river to an extraordinary degree. After decades of such efforts, Chinese people have learned how to live in peace with the river. Running through the valley of the Hongguan Mountains is the Lansang River. In this great valley, there exists an ancient wonder built many generations ago. The salt pans. In this dry, hot river valley, every day, Drolma manages her salt pans entirely on her own. These salt pans have been here along the riverside for thousands of years. Here, men transport the salt to other regions far away from the river valley through the ancient tea horse road. And all the work in the salt pans is done by women. Platforms made of mud and wood are erected beside the waterfront. The highly salty brine from up in the mountain is channeled downhill. The formation of the salt is made possible due to the abundance of sunlight and the high evaporation rate in the river valley. These salt pans have been here for thousands of years, but they require constant and careful maintenance. The salt season lasts from March to May of each year. As long as people keep watch and maintain proper care, each salt pan will produce around 10 kilograms of salt a week.
Right now, the rainy season is approaching and Drolma is awaiting the last harvest of the year. The vertical drop from the top of the mountains to the river valley is more than 2,000 meters. The deep cutting landform on both sides of the river delivers the valley a unique climate system. The high temperature and low humidity do little to promote the growth of vegetation, but it does create excellent conditions for the production of salt. And here it's a masterpiece of sunlight and wind. The salt crystals form on the salt pans and mix with the typical red soil common to the hillside. There are no fewer than 3,000 salt pans in Yanjing County and together they produce around 1.5 million kilograms of salt every year, bringing in an income to each household of about $1,500. In the arid grassland, a sandstorm is brewing. Sunid, located in the middle of the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, receives very little in the way of precipitation, but it suffers from a high evaporation rate. What was once pasture land has suffered many consecutive years of drought, and as a result, the traditional nomadic way of life in this region is facing considerable challenges. The prevailing northwest wind in Sonid will last for more than a hundred days. It's spring and the grass has not yet sprouted, but the herds of sheep have already started lambing. On the grassland, this is the most difficult season. Herdsman Su He was a member of the local art troupe. He has witnessed the gradual desertification of the grassland in his hometown. No less than one-sixth of China's land is at risk of desertification. Every year, the grazing capacity in Sonid is becoming less and less. For the inhabitants of this grassland, the degeneration is disastrous. 
it affects the lives of 400 million people. This year, fewer lambs have been born than last year, and this spring the grass has not yet begun to grow. The mothers of the lambs don't have enough milk. To remedy the situation, the herdsmen need to buy some fodder. Fortunately, when the sandstorm subsides, the grass begins to sprout the new year has begun. Suha is repairing a wind turbine. Here, deep in the grassland, this is the family's only source of electricity. For generations of these herdsmen living on the grassland, a sandstorm is just one of numerous trials they must deal with. But how can they maintain their traditional lifestyle and unique nomadic culture in an environment that is constantly changing. Suha and his family are working hard to respond to this challenge. As a clean and renewable energy resource, wind is very convenient in grassland areas. In fact, Inner Mongolia utilizes more wind power than any other part of China. Facing desertification, Sonid can be regarded as a microcosm of China. Developing as quickly as it is, China is facing challenges posed by its huge population, a shortage of resources, and its rapidly changing environment. Situated at the estuary of the Liao River, a great stretch of red saline seepweed creates a magnificent scene. This is in fact one of China's most important coastal wetlands. In spring, on the willows near the Red Beach, the Chinese penduline tit initiates its courtship routine. The most active participant is the male. It chooses a sturdy branch and then wraps around it with the fibers it has stripped from an aquatic plant. These will be used as a foundation for its nest. While constructing its nest, it sings in the hope that a nearby female will recognize its potential as a responsible partner. Panjin has a population of 1.4 million people. It's one of northeast China's fastest growing cities of the petrochemical industry.
Red Beach, situated not far from the city, is China's largest coastal wetland reserve. It is also one of the most important stopover sites in North China for migratory birds. Each year, more than 100,000 migratory birds of 260 different species drop by and rest here to refuel. Thanks to its elaborately woven nest, the male Chinese penduline tit finally gains the favor of a female. Now they can build their home together. Chinese penduline tits are superb architects. They use plant fibers to create the frame of their nest and then knit it with wool to create a home that is sturdy and comfortable. All of this is done to prepare for the arrival of their chicks. In this bird paradise, it's the chicks that are the focus of attention. Each bird family has its own unique way of life. The Saunders gull builds its nest on Red Beach. 70% of Saunders gulls in the world breed in the Punjin wetland. And a great variety of birds spend their early days on Red Beach. A month has passed and a baby Chinese penduline tit has hatched. For its parents, this is the busiest time. They take turns hunting for food and feeding the chick. The parents also have another task, to clean up the chick's droppings. In Panjin, the reed marsh and red beach create a wetland that is full of life. During the brooding season, the newborns follow their parents and learn various survival skills. On the beach, an Evoset instructs its chick on the art of hunting for food. Its beak is bent upward, forming it into the ideal tool for catching food on the muddy terrain. This Avoset is a very patient mother. At the estuary, rivers deliver and accumulate nutrients, while the rising and falling tides also bring in various supplements from the ocean. The land has thus become an area full of life. However, human activities, including the expansion of cities, have had an enormous impact on the ecological environment. Birds need to find a way to live at peace in this ever-changing environment.
To date, China has established 2,740 nature reserves, covering a total area of 1.47 million square kilometers, equivalent to one-seventh of its total land area. As part of a national strategy, biodiversity conservation is now a priority. While undergoing rapid development, China is learning how best to coexist with nature.